So I wanted to start with a question. And I think Louisa has already <coughs> excuse me, seen this question. So the question is, what could AI never do? So I'll open it to you. I'm really curious what you think about this. Are there things that you could do and think an AI could never do? I think about love. <laughs> yes, yeah, mm -hmm. that was also my fault. All right. I don't know. I, I don't have an hidden, hidden agenda. I'm just really curious <laughs> what what this uh, what this could be. Um, maybe stuff that humans even can't do, like I don't know, predict the weather for long terms. <laughs> mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. And Nadia is saying feeling anxious or embarrassed. Mm -hmm. Good question. Could you program that though? Well, is it feeling embarrassed then? Or is it being pro or supposed to feel embarrassed? Right. And, and what's the di distinction between that? Um, I think printing would be like a thing. <laughs> printing without issues would be a thing that computers could never do. <laughs> um, <laughs> but more on the topic of AI, I don't know. A couple of uh, a couple of years ago, I was thinking that a computer could never figure out. Like, um, I showed a computer an image of a cat, and he knows that it's a cat. And obviously, that's completely wrong. My prediction. Um, so take it as a a testament of my skill in the field of AI. <laughs> that was before I was interested in this whole debacle. But that got me interested as well in this, this whole puzzle of it, what AI was, what a computer could do and could not do, because um, as I'll discuss later, the AI actually fundamentally shifts how we look at computers and what we what we learn computers. So that's, that's kind of fascinating to me. Um, so I'll quickly go over who I am. Um, I teach at St. Lucas Antwerpen. These are a couple of my students at the, the one or two times that we could actually meet physically in school. We're back in, uh, in Zoom land these days, but yeah, this was, um, I wouldn't say much better times, but <laughs> some kind of least, less lockdown um, as you're all aware, I think. Um, I also do research uh, at St. Lucas Antwerpen. I, um, have a research project together with my colleague Lieve and Minskart, and we're doing a research around the creative uses of AI. So that that uh, thing here is part of it. The paper this um, refers to is also um, a package that I'll show you later, or program that I've that I've made. Um, and then I also work as a freelance um, graphic designer or uh, visualization slash media artist, where I do installation work, um, uh, websites, data visualization, um, that kind of thing, now mostly web-based. And also I coach at Jean Action uh, Labo. You can actually see Louisa here in the picture. Um, this was during um, uh, two years ago, actually, because of course for last year, all the pictures are of the VR environment that we used. Um, but this was two years ago when we could all just meet happily together in the singer. Um, so then I wanted to discuss a little bit about what AI actually is. And the shortest form that I've come up with and the most, maybe the most scripting form is that AI is actually learning computers and mapping from A to B. And I've put this word mapping in italics because that's kind of the, the magic word here, the, the word does a lot of heavy lifting here because it means, or it can mean a lot of things. It doesn't mean mapping in the sense of Google Maps, but it means mapping in the sense of turning a uh, an object in one domain into an object into another domain. And that's again, super abstract. So I think we need to see some examples of what that means. So this is an example of a mapping. This is an example where uh, we take an image that's in domain A. Um, so that's, this is our A in this case, and we map that to a word, in this case, cat. And obviously here the mapping is uh, what we call object detection. So we try to detect what the image actually contains. This is the thing that I thought AI would never be able to do or computers would never be able to do. 
Um, and we can do it with cute dogs as well. Um, but it's not just this mapping between um, an image and a word. The, out of the image, we can also extract other things. We don't actu actually extract one word. We extract um, certainty, basically, how certain we are that a dog is actually here. Um, so for example, if we show it this image, it might come up with a bunch of words about this image. It might say, well, I think there's a 90% chance that there's a desk here or a computer. There's some hands here as well. There's a notebook, there's coffee. So there's all these different things going on in this image. It's not just this one thing that comes out of this, um, this field. And actually it's all of these words. Um, like if you train the computer on these, let's say thousands of categories, it will give a value for each of these thousands of categories saying, oh, we're pretty sure that it's this one, but I'm not really sure about this one. Also, it doesn't really have to be the objects. Uh, if you, you change the way that you train it, you could also do something like this, where the mapping actually goes again from an image, but then to, let's say, age of somebody. So you can then determine that. Why you would do that, that's another question. We'll come that in, into that later. Um, and of course, it doesn't have to be images as well. Um, it can, for example, also be mapping from audio to, uh, to text, so speech to text, or what we call text recognition or speech recognition. Um, or you could do something like this where the mapping is actually saying, well, I think your product sucks. And out of that comes a sentiment saying, well, this is probably a negative review. So we probably want to treat it accordingly or talk to the customer or whatever. Um, so that's what the AI is actually doing in, in its most general sense. And right now, all of the AI examples that I showed you are examples of what I would call predictive AI, where it's predicting something. But we'll talk later about also why this can also be used for generating or making new things, generative AI. Uh, and it's actually the same principle. It's also this mapping, but it works a bit differently. Um, but before I want to do that, I want to talk a little bit about how we would go about on training the AI. Um, and I really like this quote of uh, Pablo Picasso saying, computers are useless, they can only give you answers, but um, and it wasn't talking about computers actually, but about calculators because computers weren't invented yet. Um, but the, there is something fundamental, I think, that has shifted in, and that's why I think this quote might not be entirely correct anymore, because it's very different now in the sense that in AI, we give the computer answers, not the other way around. And that's kind of a fundamental shift and I'll, I'll show it. So this is what classical programming looks like. So if people are familiar with programming, you type in rules like a Python programming code or JavaScript or whatever. You probably want to give that data, otherwise it's not very useful, like a database or whatever. And then out of that comes an answer. For example, uh, what's, what's the average age or how many people have bought my product, something like that. Um, that's a classical way of doing programming where we define the rules and the computer comes up with the answers. In AI, we actually turn this on its head. We actually, what we do is we give the computer data, but we also give it the answers and it sort of feels like cheating. Uh, and in a way it is, and we'll, we'll come back to that later as well. But machine learning is fundamentally about feeding the computer or training the computer with both the data and the answers, and then letting the computer come up with these rules again. So instead of we making the rules, we hard coding the rules. It's actually the computer figuring out the rules based on the data and the answers or the, expect, the expected answers that we get back. Um, so this shift is very, um, very fundamental because the way that we uh, write software now is very different from the way that we wrote software before. Um, we don't actually have to do the, the coding or the rule extraction anymore. It's the computer figuring it out. Now, with that come a set of issues as well, in the sense that um, sometimes these rules are a bit like a black box. We don't really know if the rules are actually the correct ones. And because the computer has written them, it doesn't write them in Python, it writes them in these massive tables of numbers. And it's up to us to figure out if they, these are actually correct or not. Um, that, that can be a problem. Um, but for now, let's talk about cats. So if we want to do uh, this, this is, sort of our rules, uh, figuring out the rules based on data and answers. So we give it a label cat and we just show a bunch of data, all, all pictures of cats. And do the same thing. For example, we feed in uh, 
all this data of pictures of dogs and then we give that the label dog and if we do that a thousand times we can actually figure out all of these thousand different um, labels or at least that's the idea so what the ai needs when it's trying to figure out these things is it needs these different parts it needs this input data then it needs this output data this is the mapping that we talked about but then of course uh, that's not enough because if we just do this the computer would be done in five seconds it also needs uh, some way of figuring out if it's doing the right thing. So it needs some metric, it needs some, some, some indication if the result is actually going in the right direction or not. Um, we actually talk about this as uh, loss. So we try to figure out how close the um, expected output or the, the generated output data uh, links up with the expected output data. So how much do we think the computer is right? Uh, what, what are they ex expecting? Now, also here, there's something to be aware of. This is the main, the main training loop, basically. This is how we train these machine learning algorithms. And one thing that we have to be aware of is that if we give the computer not enough data, um, or the data is very specific and very different from the actual data that we are going to show it later, the computer might do something that's called uh, overfitting, where it's actually trying very hard to just um, learn by rote the things that it has to see, it's sort of like doing your exam by just studying all the answers instead of trying to understand what's actually going on. Um, but this, this main approach happens for all the different uh, algorithms that we use. Only what can happen is that this becomes a bit more complex, that we have multiple inputs and outputs that are uh, linked together. But for example, for images, what we do is we give it a, an image of a cat, uh, we train this loss function, and then we get a cat back. Or we do the same thing with audio, we give it audio, there's a loss function, and that gets an audio back. So input, output, I think that's clear right now. And so what the AI learns is um, what, I, what I think of it as a representation of the data. So it's trying to figure out how best to represent the data so that if you feed it in something, it can do the same calculation and come out to a certain output. Um, and it's kind of, kind of hard to visualize because it's this multi-dimensional thing and that's always tricky in our head uh, but the way that we can think about it is if you imagine that you have this raw data that's on the left here of the slide uh, you have these dots um, some of them are filled and some of them are not filled and you're trying to make a distinction between the two now if you just look at the dots and you try to map that on the x-axis or on the y-axis say okay this exact x and y value that's the point where things change you're going to have a hard time because you would need to draw a straight line so that doesn't really work so what the computer actually does is it does all these kind of tiny little uh, changes to the data in this case it it has this tiny little let's say rotation that happens to the data where it sort of rotates shifts the data around and sort of moves that data around so it's at the right position all of these are like tiny little steps that it does in each step of the training where the representation actually matches better the input that it does um, the way that, that I've also learned to think about is, is if you have um, two, uh, I can show it here. Imagine that you have two paper towels. I'm trying best to show it to the camera. You have two paper towels and you put them together and you, you crumple them in a ball like this. What are the steps that you have to do to uncrumple that? So basically, all these tiny little steps that you have to do to form that into something that's no longer a ball but that actually separates this plane from this plane, these, these two shapes together. That's a good way to think about it. Um, and as you can see, if you, once it's crumpled up, it becomes very hard to take that and sort of see immediately from that shape of what it's going to be, or, or if I take this one, if it's the one um, handkerchief or the other one. But once it's uncrumpled in these tiny little steps, it becomes much more clear. It's like a two-dimensional um, thing that I can solve. And that's a good way to think about it, it's figuring out that representation. And that can be really simple. So for example, this is a very simple example that's being learned in machine learning, not even deep learning, but just like the machine learning 101. Imagine that you have, um, you want to predict the price of a house and you just look at one parameter in this case, which is the size of a house. So size of the house is always going to be an indicator, maybe not the biggest one, uh, but it's probably going to be a, like a significant indicator of the price of the house. And as you can see here, if you have these little dots on the graph, um, then you can see that there's like a straight line running almost through it with the size of the house. So it means that the size of the house linearly 
um, defines how pricey it's going to be. Now, in machine learning, oftentimes, this is like a luxurious example, let's say, because oftentimes it's much more complex than that. Uh, imagine going back to the, to the little paper towels, it's much more complex and, and crumpled up, uh, as I showed. And maybe this is a more um, uh, better uh, example of this. So you have these, um, these circles and you have these X's and you have to get them out of each other. And there's multiple ways that you can do this, multiple, multiple strategies. And all of them will have a, an issue because none of them will actually be entirely correct. As you can see on the left, there's underfitting, which is that the model that we use is very simple, um, maybe too simple. And so there's a lot of missed opportunities. There are a lot of things that we don't actually see. Then there's appropriate fitting where the curve is actually sort of following this, let's say natural line that we visually also would recognize as something where, okay, they, they sort of fit and you see that they don't all fit. So we have these mistakes there, but the other, like going overboard with the overfitting. So the example on the right is also not the best idea because there we are basically learning from uh, by memory which examples that we have to exclude and only excluding those examples. And that's probably way too um, over-specialized, which means that if we give it new examples, it's not going to give us a useful result because it has only seen these examples and learned from these examples. So there's, it doesn't know uh, very well what it needs to do. So in machine learning, we often have a data set, we often have a, a split data set where we don't actually have all the data. We don't give the computer all the data, but we actually train like 80% of the data. And then we leave 20% behind. We keep it behind our chest. We, uh, we, we hold the cards in our hands. And once the computer has said, well, okay, I think I'm done. Then we give it these cards and we say, okay, what do you think about this one? And we give it one that the computer has never seen. And then it, if those answers are correct, then we are getting probably on the right path towards uh, appropriate fitting as it's sent here um, instead of overfitting. So that's something that we do a lot where we, we actually split this into three data sets. One is the main data set for training. One is the validation data set where we constantly validate, not train, but validate if these results are correct. And then one at the very end, the test data set uh, is, is holdout data that we leave in our hand where we just check out at the very end if, if the data is correct. Um, so that's an approach that we can take. And of course, there's much, much, much more parameters than the ones I just showed you. So the way that you can think about it, or the way that I like to think about it is this massive switchboard or equalizer where the computer basically has to turn every knob a little bit, every training step and trying to figure out what the right configuration is. And you probably also see with this is why it's so hard to figure out what the computer has actually learned. So its rules are basically settings on these knobs. And so it's very hard from seeing at these knobs, like, okay, knob 12 is like a little bit more turned to the right than the previous step. Why is that? Well, that's super hard to figure out. So um, that's, um, that's a problem. <laughs> um, because we want to use, we want to talk about creative AI. There's uh, of course, a lot of things that I want to say about visual AI. Um, and what I want to talk about uh, so I have this split up into visual AI and then audio AI, and then we'll also talk about text AI. Um, but first I want to talk a little bit about visual AI. Visual AI is this process, or one of the steps that we can do is take an image and then turn it into text, a word. So this is a mapping from image to text. But we can also do it the other way around, right? We can also say, well, make a cat. Here's the word cat, and now make one. As you can see, the cat is sort of looking weird because it's, um, it's generated by a system called BigN. Um, but that's the other way around. What we can also do is base, do something like this, where we do an image to image translation. In this case, uh, using style transfer, where we take an image and then we give it a, a style. That's also another image. And then out comes in a, another image. Um, and then one that's used a lot, even though it looks strange, if, we, if you look at the visualization here, is where we start out from random noise, um, which we'll call the latent space. And then that turns into an image. So the image is actually comes from this random noise. And I'll get into more detail how that works. Um, and then one that's we've been recently also been working with because it's really fun to work with is um, this what's called conditional generation where we feed in an image that has some relation to the original image, but it's not exactly the same. And so by feeding it in, in a drawing, for example, it can draw cats, but you can draw anything. It will turn it into a cat. So there's lots of creative uses for that. Um, 
let's start with this first uh, mapping because there's a lot of things going on. And this mapping is generally called image recognition. So if you look at this image, um, this is basically what the computer sees when it sees an image. It sees a bunch of pixels and it doesn't really know uh, what it is. So this is very hard, I think, for, for anyone to figure out what it is. But I just wanted to show you the magnitude of the problem that's, that's underneath this thing. So how can I figure out from this part of the image what it actually means? Well, it contributes a part to the, to the larger idea of what I think the image means. But from this, it's very hard to tell. Maybe from this as well. Um, but once I start zooming out, uh, you can see that actually you can figure out that it's a bike. Um, but what the computer sees, and this is really hard um, for us to understand, but it's really important that you understand, is that the computer only sees these parts, right? It only, oh, sorry, it only goes and looks at these individual pixels. That's what it has to work with. And so it's very hard, again, if we need to write the rules, if we have to write Python code that says, well, if pixel blah, blah, blah is red, then bike equals true. I mean, that doesn't really work that way, right? It's much more complex than that. Um, and that's also why I wanted to talk about it. So this is the this demystifying part, let's say. Um, and so this has been a problem for years and years and years. And only until computers became uh, much faster were we actually able to solve this problem. And the reason why we can now solve it is because we can give the computer much more computing power to, to do this kind of processing, and specifically with uh, GPUs, so graphical processing power, uh, which are very fast at, at this kind of uh, problems. So we give the computer inputs. Um, those inputs are uh, images. And then the first layers are actually the layers where we just try to figure out little patterns of contrast. So we, we're not really concerned with trying to figure out if it's a face or if it's a man or a woman. In this case, we're just trying to figure out uh, edges basically so trying to figure out okay is is there an edge of something or like a head or and then later on as we as we progress through these layers we see that the machine actually learns these um, face features so parts of the face so it might recognize parts of a mouth or parts of an, uh, the fragment of a nose or something like that but not entire face and then it sort of combines all of these higher level representations into things where it actually turns that into um something that that is a face and as uh, as we progress through these layers from left to right we'll also see that the things that the computer is trying to understand are much more abstract and this is sort of modeled on how our brain works but in a very very loose way uh, so it's it's um it might work well in the beginning as a metaphor but i think it's really a separate thing um, what the output layer finally does is basically gives you an answer for all of these different um, options, uh, like if it's a man or woman, or if if we know what the age is, for example. Um, and this is a very simple, like a machine learning one-on-one thing again, where we feed it an image of an, uh, a number. So this is um, somebody, a handwritten digit of the number four. This is a very simple uh, machine learning um, test or example. And, but it's very easy to study. So in layer A, we can actually see those representations. And we see that the computer has tried to figure out like the lines. So you have these um, zigzag lines where it's trying to figure out, okay, what are the corners of this image or what are the lines of this image? Then in layer two, it's trying to combine these multiple representations into more complex formulations. And then in layer three, as you can see, it's very abstract. We don't know what the computer is doing anymore. This is the part where the computer is sort of combining all this knowledge from these different representations of layer one and two into these more complex, higher dimensional representations. And then finally, hopefully, it comes back with an answer saying, okay, this is the this is the number four. The way that it's written here, it's kind of weird. It looks like a slider where you have all these numbers and the four is like highlighted. Um, the way that we called it is, is a one hot encoding. It's basically one of the numbers is uh, hot or is on and all the no the other ones are like switches that are turned off so this is a way that we can uh, train this model so it knows what the what the data is like uh, the way that we feed it the answer um, so going back to our cat one of the first uh, uh, filters let's say that we might do is try to do something where you have like a sobel itch detection so we're trying to make a sort of a filter where we can figure out all the little edges of the image and as you can see this highlights the eyes the ears the whiskers things like that and that turns into this representation so if you have the full face you're going to try to find out all of these different parts of the cat that are cat-like and then turn that into higher level features and then come back with a word uh, for that which is cat so this is this whole 
system uh, is uh, described and it's called convolutional neural networks. The reason why they're convolutional, so this process, this thing is a convolution filter and like you can do this in Photoshop as well. Um, but the interesting part is that it's, um, it's uh, unaware of the position of something in the image. So the problem with other kinds of um, machine learning things that they did before was that they tried to figure out or that the, it was very dependent on the position. So if the cat would move, they would no longer recognize it. The thing with convolutional neural networks is that they're independent of the place where something happens, which sort of makes sense in images because we don't really care uh, where, where the cat is in the frame. It's still going to be a cat. Um, and let's see some code because why not? Um, so I just wanted to show you this because it's very short that this is all you need basically to get a convolutional neural network working. So this is very well studied. It's easy to uh, use and interpret. The results are, are fairly okay. Um, and although I've, I've worked with mobile nets um, recently and we had to improve some things. Um, so it's not perfect uh, by far, but it's sort of okay. Um, and it's easy. And that's, that's also why I wanted to do it. It might not be so fancy or flashy as all the other things that I'm going to show later, but it's a really good one to get started with. And there are some really interesting examples of that. Um, so last year I worked uh, with a student, Marie Kort, um, in our um, code uh, studio. So that's our, like our media lab. Uh, we worked with her to make this Faces of the Moon project where she was um, asking people to draw what they saw on the moon. And then uh, in, it was not just them interpreting the moon, but the moon, uh, the, not the moon, but the machine learning was then interpreting their drawings. So it was trying to figure out what they were drawing. And it was pretty accurate because we, we trained this from scratch on a huge data set that Google provided of all people all sketching. Uh, and the results were actually quite good. Um, there's this other project that I really, really like by Dries and Verstappen. Um, and it's called Paraidolia. And this is an example, I think, of a project where the, the machine learning is very important, but it's also understandable and maybe simple, but it's still very beautiful. And what you see here are grains of sand. Uh, but what they did is they have this installation where they have a microscopic scanner that's looking at these grains of sand, and then they have a face detection algorithm on that. And so every grain of sand that it detects as a face is then shown in this, um, this screen uh, that you see here on the side. So it's this real-time installation looking at all these tiny little pieces of sand, trying to figure out if there are faces in them and then, then showing them on the screen. Um, and it's really nice because uh, the setup is really beautiful, but it's also from a machine learning standpoint, it's actually um, understandable. Let's say it's very controllable. It, it's, uh, you know what, what you're going to get, but it's, it has this very beautiful, unique quality that tells a lot about um, was trying to do. And also talks about this human condition where we see faces and everything. So really like this project. Um, there are a bunch more, but I wanted to continue. So um, I want to talk about this approach. Uh, this seems like a weird approach where we take this random stuff and then we get an image out of that. But this is actually one where the main focus is right now on research. Uh, these are called uh, GANs or generative adversarial networks. And the system with GANs is a bit different from what we saw before. As you see, the image, the input image is not actually an image. It actually starts from random noise. Um, and I have a little movie prepared about that. So it's not training one algorithm. It's actually training two algorithms at the same time. A generator algorithm that's trying to figure out and trying to make anything, and then a discriminator network. So in this case, um, it's trying to make money. And so we are making fake money. Um, and the generator gen just generates something, but this script, wait, I'll go back, uh, just to give myself a bit more space. So the way that this, this is described oftentimes is um, when, uh, when you have a fraudster and the bank, for example. And so the fraudster is trying to make fake money and the bank has to, dis to uh, discriminate or figure out if the money is fake. Now, in the beginning, both of them don't really know what's going on. So not, neither the generator knows what money looks like, but also the discriminator doesn't know what money looks like. So it's like the most stupid bank uh, teller ever. And so because they don't know anything of, of this, um, the discussion is not going well. So this is like a step one of the discussion where the generator just makes anything. Uh, in the beginning, this also just looks like uh, an image with noise in it. Um, 
but because the discriminator doesn't know anything about money, it's going to say, well, this is perfect. This uh, looks good. I'll take it. Uh, but then there's another step. So the discriminator is also trained. And the discriminator is trained by looking at images of real money. So there's the algorithm is actually feeding it images of real money, saying, no, no, this is way off. You have to look at this. And then the discriminator figures out, oh, wait, I have to be more careful next time. So now the generator generates new money, again, thinking this will be perfectly fine. But it's the discriminator saying, uh, no, back to the drawing table. Um, I'm not so sure about that anymore. And now the generator has to do more work but because now the generator has to figure out, okay, this, this sort of looks more like money, I think. Um, and it's sort of this cat and mouse game where one gets better at generating things and then the discriminator gets better at recognizing these things. So now the, the discriminator is like, yeah, you're getting there um, close. Um, and so you have this, this cat and mouse game where things are constantly improving. This turns out to be a very, very useful technique that's used now a lot because it starts, um, it can basically recognize any kind of images, but it can also generate new images. And that's this generator part, that's what's left actually, generates new stuff. And this is really interesting. Um, so again, a graph. At the very bottom of this graph, you actually see this random noise. So the generator actually starts from, from nothing, from that random noise. It never sees the images. It only sees this random noise as input and the feedback it gets from the discriminator saying, no, you're close or you're far off. Remember this game where you hide something and you have to say like hot or cold. So that's sort of what the, what the generator gets. It gets some value of whether it's hot or cold, where it's in the neighborhood of correct or not. The discriminator does get a training set. Uh, and so the discriminator can actually figure out what these things are. Um, in general, this is the way that they're built. So this, this noise, then we scale that up. We make it bigger and bigger and bigger until it becomes an image. And then for the discriminator, we do the inverse. So we take this image and we filter it down, 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 down until it becomes one thing, which is the answer to this question of whether it's a fake money or not. Um, and again, as I said, it's used a lot. This is a project that we did in Labo two years ago with Jude. Um, she actually drew all of these by hand. So she had all these drawings. So she basically provided her own data set by doing all of these uh, tiny little drawings of her hometown in Syria. Um, and she was, oh, um, she was drawing this from memory. Um, and then what she also did was she provided this other data set where she was trying to destroy this memory. So she was taking these same images, but then destroying them through digital and other means. Um, and then we fed that into the machine and we tried to figure out whether it would reconstruct them. So on the left, you see an image uh, of the original ones. And on the right, you see the image of the destructed ones. Uh, and it's kind of interesting to see how the machine's trying to figure out um, where the image looks like. And as you see, there's an animation aspect to it. So it's not just generating random images over and over and over, but there's actually an, an animation. Um, and you can see it a little tiny bit in the, in the destroyed image. You can sort of see the outline if you look carefully. Um, I think it's really beautiful. Um, so this latent space is something to look at because it's not just randomness. It actually allows us to travel through it. You can sort of think it like a landscape and we can move from point A to point B. And as we move, we actually can generate images that are sort of connected to each other. Um, so for example, this is a way that we can move from one image to another image. So if you train it on faces, which is what a lot of these um, examples do, we can actually move between faces. And so every face in the middle sort of becomes its own relative phase because there's never a point where we say, okay, now we're at a specific point. No, every point is basically a valid uh, position you can take in this latent space. Um, there's a beautiful installation of uh, Mario Klingemann as well, um, where the uh, you have these real-time uh, faces uh, that's, that are generated based on people walking in front of the installation and they sort of get integrated into this sculpture, this digital sculpture as it's continuing. Um, there's uh, Helena Sarin who did uh, nice work with this as well. Um, and this is Scott Eaton's work, uh, Body Soup, um, where he actually has all of these um, self-made drawings and then he's combining them into this really massive, almost like a brush that he can use where he can paint with these, um, with these, um, yeah, uh, sculpture-like uh, flesh things. <laughs> Uh, but it's it's really beautiful to see, and also as it animates. Um, uh, and then this work, uh, I'll come back to that uh, later as well, is uh, by Anna Riedler, um, uh, where she actually did a lot of manual work, actually getting 
making all these images by hand and then using that as our own data set, sort of like the work that, of Jude that I showed before. Um, so that's, that's the second approach where we take this random image, this latent space, and then turn it into uh, an actual image. And then we'll talk about this approach. And I think this is, this is something where a lot of things are happening right now because this is sort of like the, the holy grail. You type in a word and out comes uh, of an image. This is, for me, that least I was crazy. And so the first time that I saw this happening was this uh, system called Attention GAN or ATN GAN. Um, and that was the promise of the system. So we used this two years ago uh, at Labo as well. And the results are, I would say not great. <laughs> um, so this is what it thinks of a beautiful woman with long hair and smiling face. Um, make of that what you wish. Um, a robot that wants to kill all humans. Okay, that makes sense. And then it, this is Mark Zuckerberg, according to the algorithm. Um, yeah. The, the funny part about this, and this is there's this great talk by Janelle Shane of Weird AI or AI Weirdness, um, where she actually fed these images back into these um, image recognition algorithms that we talked about before. So if this image doesn't look like Mark Zuckerberg at all, at least not to us, but if we feed this image into these recognition algorithms, what turns out is that these recognition algorithms actually know perfectly what's going on. So these algorithms actually give you back, oh, this is Mark Zuckerberg, or this is a woman and she has long hair. So somehow this, this encoding, this representation that it has learned sort of makes sense for its own image recognition algorithms, but not to us anymore. So it has this secret code between the recognition algorithms and the generation algorithms that it's figuring out where it's communicating on a, on a different level almost. Um, so yeah, there's some improvement to be made and recently, and I mean very recently, I think in the last couple of months, there has been improvements made. And for me, this is, this is um, at least for this part, this is kind of scary up till a level where I wouldn't actually show this to my students in the first grade in the bachelors because I think they will just quit maybe. Um, so this is called DALI. Um, and what it does again is it's learned this mapping between text and images. And so um, they've, they have this massive, massive, massive data set that they train on. And from that, it can learn new things. So here is an illustration of a baby daikon radish in a tutu walking a dog. And you can go on their web uh, page and actually change all these words and make different things. Um, maybe not the most useful thing, but it's doing these things. The reason why they have such a weird um, solution is because they don't want it they, to show that, that it, this is not something that it learned. It, hadn't, it hasn't seen this image yet. It's generating this image from scratch. Um, or these are, yeah, crazy. This is an armchair in the shape of an avocado. And as you can see, it's just doing that. You give it that assignment and it's just making, making that. It's figuring out these visual parameters between these two uh, elements. Um, this is a clock in the shape of an avocado. So you can change what it, what the shape needs to be, or this is an, a coffee table in the shape of an avocado. Okay. Um, that works as well. So it, it's kind of scary good as well. So it's not just doing avocados though. Um, so this is a, a coffee table in the shape of a butterfly wing and it's trying to get these visual parts of the butterfly into this shape of the, um, a coffee table in this case, or in the shape of a purse, if you want. Um, so this is scary good. And um, yeah, this is where we're at right now. Um, also this text, which is really weird. So it's, you can say, well, give me a storefront and write the word open AI on it. So there's not that many storefronts with the word open AI on it, but it can generate these um, like it was nothing. Um, and you can change the word. So you can have mouthwash with the word Skynet on it. Why not? So. Um, yeah, this is, this is insane to me. Um, and the, the way that this is done now is by OpenAI, which, which is a big, big research institution that's also led by uh, Elon Musk. Uh, but they have this enormous, enormous capacity like Skynet uh, of computers that we can't really access. So there's been some work in the community to actually replicate this work using open source tools. Uh, and there's this recent thing that's called Deep Days, which is not at that level yet, but it's getting there. So I think it's really interesting. Uh, and you can actually run this on their um, Google Colab, and I'll show you at the end some links with that. Um, and it 
sort of has its own style, but it's really interesting. So you can do mist over green hills. Again, it starts from the text and then generates the image, not the other way around. Um, shatter plates on the grass. Uh, cosmic love and attention, I like, like this one. Uh, and then a time traveler in the crowd. And it's, it's not limited by anything. You can just feed it any kind of word and it will generate uh, an image based on that. So it's really, really crazy. Um, I want to talk about this um, mapping as well, this image to image mapping. Um, not too long though, because uh, it's been seen and I don't think it's so spectacular anymore. Um, but it's used for things like style transfer, where we give it an image and then we say, do the image in the style of this other image. And then it turns that into this. It now became this, this um, mobile photo filter or smartphone photo filter thing. So it's kind of, it's past its prime, let's say. Um, or a couple of years ago, you could use face app where you could actually turn a face from a young face into an old face and the other way around by doing this, learning this mapping between young and old faces. The cool thing is that it's learning this from not direct mapping one-to-one. -one. We don't have these young and old faces next to each other. We just have some young faces and some old faces and it's learning a combination of what makes these features different. So it's kind of interesting. Um, and I talked about this one before. Um, this is um, another type of approach where we actually feed in an image, but the image becomes interactive. So we can actually draw something and it turns into something else. And this approach is called conditional image generation. So as before, we talked about um, image generation from random noise. In this case, we are talking about image generation from an image that we can actually produce. Either we draw it or we have a, an editor where we can do something with it. Um, and this is really fun. It's really nice to train. Um, it's, it's easy to work with. It's sort of reliable. Uh, and there's many, many applications that we can do with it. So I think this is um, a really fun uh, approach. It's a bit older, so it's from 2016, which in machine learning years is like grandpa age or something. But in the um, space here, it's really, uh, it's still very, very, uh, very useful and, and nice to work with. And the quality is really good. Um, and then related to that, we also have Gauguin from NVIDIA. Uh, which uses the same approach, but then it allows you to draw um, certain colors. So instead of just drawing one thing, it's always the same thing. You can draw in color. So you can say, okay, um, uh, let's say uh, blue is the sea. And then we have this other color for the sky. And then we have another color, other color for trees or grass or uh, whatever. And it's basically combining these images from making it into a new photorealistic image that we haven't seen yet, just by drawing a sketch of what that image should look like. Um, and again, this is something that you can do uh, yourself. There's a web interface that you can do where you can actually start drawing these things. So it's really nice. Um, and it doesn't always only work for uh, images. There's also a way to do it for 3D. So um, this is sort of at the beginning uh, still, um, but this mapping from and where it's just taking an image and then from that image, it's trying to take clues of how that image is going to look like in 3D. So it's turning that into what are called voxels basically. So 3D pixels, um, it's trying to figure that out from things like the, the way that the light works or what it thinks are the, the foreground and the background, like uh, blurriness, for example. Um, and it's generating these shapes. So as you can see, it's still quite rough. So this is from last year, um, but it's getting into an interesting position because this is, there's not that much data in the image. It has to figure out a lot of things. Like in 3D, you can actually turn this model around, but you can't do that with the image. So how does the, what does the back look like? So it sort of has to invent a backside for these, uh, for these shapes. So that's kind of a, an interesting approach, I think, as well. Um, so these are some image algorithms. And I think a lot of space is done with image algorithms. I want to talk really shortly about audio AI. Um, I don't want to bombard you with audio, so I'm just going to talk uh, a little bit with uh, slides. This is the one that I've used before um, for a project called Sample RNN. Um, and again, we're learning this mapping, right? So we're learning a mapping, in this case, from sound to sound. So we're generating new sounds um, based on existing sounds that we are learning. And so what Sample RNN is doing, or um, let, well, I'll, I should start with the beginning. Generating sound is hard. 
whereas I said with images, if you do image detection, it doesn't really matter where something is. For sound, it very much matters where the sound is, because if you get it wrong, the sound sort of flips around or it does weird things. So having knowing where each sample of sound is is very important. And so what sample RNN does, and I think is really um, key to that, is it's learning this hierarchy of levels, but not just hierarchy as we see in deep learning, but it's learning to decompose sound at its different qualities of levels. And this is good, just goes up to three levels, but in a minute I'll show you more, uh, where it's trying to figure out each individual sample, so each individual sound level. If you work with sound, you know that there's like a 44.1 kilohertz, so it's like 44,000 samples per second that it's making. So that's a tier one, the lowest level. And then from that, it's basically combining all these sounds into higher level things, what are called frames. And then it's combining these again into something that you could think of as beats, for example. And then if you think about it, you could combine those into like phrases maybe, and you combine those into a song and maybe it figures out the whole thing um, like that. Again, I'm not going to bombard you with it because the best example that I found is this one, which is from the data bots. It's called Relentless Doubleganger. And it's basically a, an infinite uh, death metal live stream that's just generating infinite death metal um, based on sample RNN it's kind of difficult to listen to <laughs> but you should give it a try so uh, you can look it up look it up later um and for a long time this was actually the cutting edge but then i think last year again OpenAI came up with this project called jukebox uh where they figured out that there is a better way using this system that they also use for text generation or which we'll talk about in a minute um and this actually works pretty well um, where you could have um, music from one style generated into another style. So you could do pop in the style of Frank Sinatra, for example, uh, and it gives this really weird, um, really weird results. Uh, I tried it myself because I was doing a sound generation project, um, but the only thing that I could get out of it was fine in the beginning, but then after I think about 10 or 12 seconds, it started turning everything into country music. So whatever I fed into it, it always became country music at some point. So it was kind of <laughs> annoying because I didn't want to go there, but it just went on. So whatever uh, went in became country at the end. So it was really a fan of that. Um, it's probably I missed a parameter or something, but it's also, also funny um, to hear. Um, and then I think what's uh, what's also, it's not that new, although this research is quite new, but um, it's been studied a li uh, little bit as well, is this idea of, well, we know all of these things about visual algorithms, so can't we apply them to the sound as well? And turns out, yes, you can. So what they do is instead of using sound directly, they take the sound and they turn it into this spectrogram. And spectrogram is basically a mapping of all the, uh, frequency components of the sound. So the high sounds or the high notes, the low notes, the middle notes and so forth. And uh, for voice as well, you have uh, deep sounds and higher sounds. So everything in between. Uh, so you do this, this mapping and then you just use the algorithms that you use for visual, uh, for visual um, detection for visual generation. So you take these and you do things like style transfer to them and then you can turn that into something else. And it's, it's at a point, again, it's very, very recent. It's, came out I think at the end of last year um, but it's at a point where you now start getting results that are getting really really good so this is super interesting um, anyway I have to continue so I want to talk about text um, because even though text maybe in the beginning doesn't seem like a very um, visual thing yet there's lots of lots of fun to be had and then it's just a huge thing because text can serve a lot as this um, beginning of creativity or just as a thing in itself as well. And if we talk about generating text, we have to talk about recurrent neural networks. Um, and so the idea with recurrent neural networks is that we have the same approach of all these layers, but and that, that are these little arrows that go back on themselves, these loops that turn back on themselves. These are really important. You have these feedback loops inside of the network. And these feedback loops are really important because they make sure that yet each step actually knows about the previous step. Because if you think about it, that's what texts need to do, right? A recurrent neural network basically has to figure out what, a, um, what the next letter is. If it does text generation, it has to have a memory of what the previous letters are. Again, you can't do it like with a cat where it doesn't really matter where it is. Well, here, the position of the letter in the word actually matters a lot because if the position is somewhere else, it's a very different word. Um, 
And so recurrent neural networks were used to do prediction, but it turns out that you can predict, and I would use this between quotes, you can predict the next letter. And by predicting the next letter, you're basically generating new text. So you ask the system to, what do you think is the next letter? And then you feed in that new word and then you say, okay, what do you think now? And so if we keep doing that, we can basically have something that generates poetry because it's just generating these infinite um, predictions of the next letter and just by that generating the whole text. And that works really well. So already in 2015, there was this huge post by Andrei Karpati, who's the uh, head of AI for Tesla now, um, talking about the effectiveness of the current neural network for anything from text generation, but also generating pixels from that and things like that. Um, so these basic approaches are very easy to understand. And well, they, they require their own workshop, but uh, for sure, but they're easy to understand and you can basically build them from scratch. Um, but they work really well. Um, now, this has been a few years, so the world has moved on a little bit from that, uh, although they're still useful to the system of attention and transformers. And so the idea, in short, with attention is that before we just look with kernel neural network, you have this tiny little memory that just looks at the previous letter. And that works, but of course, it becomes much harder to have this, this memory of, okay, what's going on in the text. If we are talking about a character in one sentence, having to know that it's still the same character in the next sentence, it requires much more than just looking at the next letter. It's a higher level that we have to look at. And so what attention does is basically figuring out, okay, if I'm word A, which word am I linked to? What's the most important word I have to refer to? Um, and that's what attention is doing. And so from that came this huge, huge, massive um, research called GPT-2 and then later GPT-3, which are these um, massive neural networks. And I mean uh, massive, it's, it's again research from OpenAI, but it took them um, 355 GPU years to train. So if you have one computer, it would take that one computer 355 years to actually train this whole model. Um, it's, it was an expensive, it cost, I think, $2.4 million to, to just do the training for this whole model. And basically they fit it with all the text from the internet. Um, and then out of that comes um, a text generation model that works surprisingly well. So you feed it in this basic text, like Lake Loss and Gimli Advance on the Orcs, and then it generates this new uh, text um, below it. And it's surprisingly coherent. Although if you start reading, you'll start seeing that there are these problems uh, with the text where, uh, in this case, Aragorn is not actually part of the battle, but then becomes part of the battle at some point. So it becomes this weird um, thing, but it sort of feels like this uh, written thing. And of course it has applications everywhere. So you would think of it as uh, a chatbot, for example, where you would feed it in text and it would ge generate you uh, new text. So for commercial applications, this is used a lot. Uh, also, unfortunately for spam, this is used a lot because it's very easy to generate new text that the computer has never seen um, based on random text. And then a really fun um, thing where it's been used is this, this uh, game called AI Dungeon, which is a text-based game that is massive. If you, you can download it or you could download the old version, but it's like six gigabytes uh, for a text adventure game. So you think where it's spending all its time, but that's because it has this whole gigantic model on your computer and trying to figure out what the next sentence is. And so the weird thing about a, a AI dungeon and the, the crazy part about it is it's completely unstructured. So it starts with a prompt. It says, well, you're an orc and blah, blah, blah. And then you can just type anything, but anything. And it's basically the computer just invents the rest of the story. Um, so you can say like whistle for this, like a fantasy thing, whistle, for, I'm not into these fantasy thing, but whatever, whistle for one of the dragons to come back. And then it says, well, you whistle for the dragon to return. It flies over to you, lands on your shoulder. Now let's transform into a dragon. You change into a dragon and it flies away. Now let's eat the moon. You fly over to the moon and eat it. You feel very full afterwards. So it does something with the sticks, which is, incredibly interesting that it's it's it knows that eating the moon will probably make you feel very full so it, but it's never going to say no well it is at some point it's um it's it says no but not in this context like it goes along with the flow even if you do these really weird things and oftentimes it turns into weirdness because that's the fun part of it um and then I like this one where it says, look, Jesus says, holding out his hand and touching your chest with his forefinger. Can I be perfectly honest with you? You nod slowly. And then you say, sure, sure, Jesus. Shit ain't easy, Jesus says. <laughs> so that's the AI uh, 
inventing this or this one where it says you scream in horror and dismay but nobody seems to notice that anything's wrong the wedding proceeds as planned <laughs> um yeah you should try playing this it's really fun um there are no limits um and then what turns out is that well it's not just text or let's say we think of text just as normal text but it doesn't have to be only that um it can be much more than that for example um we can have an uh a movie here let's see if it plays hello i don't get any result here oh, yeah there we go so i can type a button that looks like a watermelon and now the text it generates is actually html it's no longer text it's just generating html for me um like what <laughs> because it has been trained on all text they literally mean all text so that also means all the html of a page so now it's generating that in uh, white which we can't see and now we can say well do it in red and now it's generating this html text in red um and it knows colors it knows countries and you can generate tables of stuff and it's just really really weird because it sort of turns it becomes programming it's basically the ai doing programming and of course there's lots of questions that you can ask and that's also why i wanted to definitely cover this this part about uh, ethics of ai uh we we're going a bit over time but i hope that's fine um and if we talk about ethical ai i think we also have to talk about um algorithmic bias and so what algorithmic bias is basically means is that the ai has learned this mapping but it's learning learning things that we don't want it to learn basically um, it has figured out that some things are more important than other things and it has figured that out because that's how we look at the world or how in general western countries look at the world and somehow in that data that's already represented and the, the computer is trying to just do the best it can at trying to figure these things out and it's taking over our own biases and turning them into algorithmic biases um, and the influences of that can be really scary for example, it's been used in something where uh, called predictive policing, where they try to figure out where the next crime is going to be. Can anyone spot the problem with this? <laughs> I think it's kind of obvious um, <laughs> why this is. In, uh, in Rotterdam, actually, Rotterdam wants to become a smart city. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and mm -hmm. uh, they've used this before um, in to predict which kind of um, neighborhoods had a high risk factor, but the data that was fed to this um, uh, algorithm wasn't necessarily unbiased. So mm -hmm. and social housing would account for a more mm -hmm. dangerous environment or etc. And actually because the predictions and because of this map, the map became sort of holy mm -hmm. uh, or true. Yeah. Um, and and they, uh, the police was by that um, allowed to go into houses mm -hmm. so it's got yeah that's to me at least that's kind of scary because this is a predictive heat map that doesn't really it, yeah. it's not transparent into which data has been fed to the machine to right right result. and because you're right and because it is a black box it sort of becomes this you defer to the algorithm you let the algorithm make the decision for you and in that you sort of give up your own ideas of of what is fair or, or right because you think that the algorithm is always correct but the algorithm has learned the same biases and then if you use that same data to retrain the algorithm again next time well it turns out that that's just going to enforce the problem because you've only looked now in the areas where you think crime happens more so of course you find more crime because that's the only places you look and so that reinforces that idea that most crime happens there so this is a huge problem um but we're not there yet there's more <laughs> um this one i think is um it's really interesting because this is what happens if you just let a company run wild with its ideas so you can do face analysis um you can do face prediction there's image recognition algorithms that do that uh so let's try to figure out what kind of face you have and this almost goes back to this this old school idea of a phrenology where you could find by the bumps in people's heads you can find out what kind of person they were um 
And so they have this handy list of categories, and this is really from their site, I wasn't pretending. So by, they can look at for a high IQ, academic researcher, professional poker player, or terrorist, because that's... <laughs> so just by looking at an image of the face, they could figure out, at least that's what they think, uh, what this is. So yeah, this is, to me, this is um, just insane, but it's a commercial project. You can, you can, you can buy this and people are buying this. So um, this is something that, that happens right now. Um, and there's this really interesting um, uh, paper by Joy Boalambini and Timnit Gebru, who was recently fired from Google. Uh, this was a whole mess. Uh, but what they talk about is this distinction between face detection and then color. So the substantial disparities in the accuracy of classifying darker females, lighter females, darker males, lighter males, gender classification systems require urgent attention if commercial companies are to build genuinely fair, transparent, and accountable facial analysis algorithms. Um, so what they discovered is that there is a huge discrepancy between the recognition for white faces versus black faces um, or brown faces. So there's this huge difference between uh, how accurate a, com a computer is um, between these. And there's also this, this movie of... Um, this soap dispenser that uses AI, let's say, where if you hold your hand under it and you have a white hand, it works perfectly. But if you're a black person, you hold your hand under it, it doesn't actually do anything. It doesn't dispense soap because it doesn't detect your hand as a valid hand. Um, now, what was striking to me is that this is not, almost never done um, um, like um, uh, by design, but this is something that happens just by by doing the most normal the straight the straightest path um, and so as you said well the algorithms are never unbiased that's true but they also can never be unbiased so there's there's always going to be bias in that and i wanted to show that by making a sentiment classifier together <laughs> very shortly um, so what does a sentiment classifier do well it it um, takes this word and then it turns that into a sentiment so it takes a sentence like uh, okay, I'm I'm happy with your product, and then it turns that into a positive sentiment, or your product sucks, and it turns that into a negative sentiment. Very useful. Um, so if we want to build that, what do we need? Well, we need to find uh, word embeddings. We need to find a way that we can turn words into numbers. Um, we need to acquire a training and test data set. So we need to know what are positive and negative words. Uh, we then need to train this whole thing. Uh, and then we can, once we've trained it, we can compute um, these scores and figure out if the positive or negative sentiments happen. And then profit, maybe, I don't know. Um, so word embedding. So there are these existing word embeddings. So a word embedding, again, is like a point in multidimensional space saying, okay, this is a man, this is his position, there's a woman, that's her position in this graph. And then there's this link between the two. And this is really interesting. We can compute uh, the the direction between man and woman and we can take that same direction transfer it to somewhere else and say okay um, a man is to a woman as a king is to a queen for example so it knows these these are related because they they travel in the same direction so this is a very useful skill to have but we don't do that from scratch right we use these existing data sets this is sort of where the problem occurs and the same thing we do for training test data so we don't have all these test data of positive and negative, but where can we find this? Well, movie reviews, ideal. So movie reviews have a long list of text and then they have a star there and the star basically indicates if the movie is good or not. Um, so IMDB has this massive data set of text where people just write about the movie, fine. And then there's also sentiment lexicons that we can take. So there's these existing data sets. Um, and then we train. So there's this code that we can run. Um, and then we compare and then we actually compute these sentiment scores. So now we've trained it. Okay, let's see if it works. So we take this text sentiment and we say, this example is pretty cool. And it says 3.889. Okay, perfect. That's a positive sentiment, a value that's above zero. That's fine. Then we say, this example is okay, 2.7. Okay, that's um, less good than pretty cool. That makes sense. And then we can say, hmm, this example sucks. Okay, we get a negative score. So, right, it seems to be working, fine. Uh, we can go in production, feed our algorithm, but some smart ass at our company has figured out to actually try it with different sentences. Um, because if you stop here, and this is really important to understand, if you stop here, it feels like you've done your job. It works, right? We've tested it, we've tested it with three examples, it works, let's put it in production. Um, 
But let's ask it different questions and see what happens. So behold the monstrosity that we have created. Let's ask it, let's go get Italian food and we get a positive score, that's fine. Let's try, let's go get Chinese food. We get a less positive score, a slightly less positive score. Let's try, let's go get Mexican food. Hmm. It seems that it doesn't really like Mexican food. Again, it's a computer. It doesn't know what, <laughs> it doesn't have every, any preference for food, but it has sort of learned that this is important. Um, let's try it with names. My name is Emily. Okay, positive. My name is Heather. Mm, little less so. My name is Yvette. My name is Shanika. And we get this negative score. So as you can see, there is this, it has learned something from these data sets that, that we just got from the internet. Like we didn't do anything special. We didn't put that in there. But somehow it has learned from these word embeddings and from these sentiment uh, scores, these, uh, these IMDb movie reviews, for example, it has learned that there is a negative mapping between names like Shanika and the sentiment analysis. And this is really scary because if we try to take um, something like this and it's the same thing and we turn it into a job search solution like Google is doing here, for example, um, well, we might feed it a CV, like a motivation letter of somebody. And it's just, it turns out that we don't actually know what the computer is looking like because we never feed it. We never get two exactly the same cover letters, right? We get very different ones, but the computer is cheating a lot. It's trying to find the shortest path to the solution. So if, it's, if it turns out that the computer can just look at the name and just figure out that only the name is important. And if the name is Belgian sounding or Flemish sounding or Dutch sounding versus if it's, I don't know, Greek sounding or uh, Senegalese sounding or whatever, or Indian sounding, then, uh, then maybe it figures on that. And again, we don't know if we don't ask these questions before. It's very hard for us to discover that this is a problem. Um, and it's also very hard to fix because we, there's no unbiased data set. This is just all fed with text from the internet. We didn't do anything special where we say, oh, uh, black people equals whatever. No, it's just in there. Remember this massive switchboard that I showed, like all the parameters are set. We don't really know what the racist parameter is. We can't turn it off uh, like that. And also like there's very definitions of what it means to turn that off. Um, and it's very hard to fix. And I, <laughs> I think this is crazy because what Google does is it, it's just fixing its algorithm by just removing gorillas from its Im image labeling search because it turns out that black people were often identified as gorillas in their data set. And instead of trying to fix that problem, what they did is they just removed the word gorilla. So it never could return that as an answer. And that's what they did to fix it. So it's super hard to fix. Like Google doesn't, doesn't even know how to fix it. So this is not an, an easy solution to think. I don't want to end on this bad, <laughs> bad uh, ending because I, I think as artists, we actually have, um, an opportunity to work with this information that we have, but also to use it for good. And I think a nice example that I showed in the beginning as well of Anna Ritler's work is, uh, it's what she did is she curated her own data set. So instead of going out and taking the IMDb movie reviews and basically making the lazy approach, she actually bought all these tulips, figured them out, photographed them nicely on the back background, cut them a little bit and make all these tiny little pictures of all these beautiful tulips, all these pictures that she took uh, all in the same background, this perfect data set that you just made entirely by hand. And once you have that data set, then you can start generating these new things that are always these beautiful flowers that come up. So doing this by hand, making, being a curator of your own data, I, I think in this approach is, uh, it's really important. Now I know you're eager to get started. So what, what can we do? And this is the, the end of my presentation almost. So I want to show you some tools. I think by far the easiest thing to do to start with, and you should definitely try that is um, something like uh, runway. Um, yeah. I also see there's a, there's a lot of comments and I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, there's this great uh, example of runway, which is, uh, a machine learning application where you can just feed in your own data set and then you start training. Um, it's really quick. It runs on the, on the cloud, but you can give it credits and things like that and works really well. Um, although it's limited for some approaches, but there's a lot of things that you can do. Um, a little bit hardcore or much more hardcore is uh, Google Colab, uh, where a lot of these algorithms are available in this online notebook style 
approach with Python code. Oftentimes it looks very scary, but it turns out that you can just run this and then press run all and it just goes through the whole script, does the training, and then you can sort of change your own bits, say, okay, I have a different data set to feed or I have different parameters that I want to do. Uh, this deep data algorithm, for example, runs in Google Colab. So this, this image generation algorithm that generates new images from text, you can run through Colab. And the nice thing about Colab is it's free. So you can you can just uh, run it on Google's cloud for free. And that works really well, but it's it's a bit hard to figure out. Um, we have actually built a layer on top of that. Um, well, we've made two applications. One of, is uh, Gandalf, which we uh, also showed in Labo two years ago, uh, which is an uh, an image generation system that works on, on GANs that also uses Google Cloud. Uh, you can train it with batches of images and then it's generating new images for you. It's sort of experimental, but um, it's it's really nice and you get these really interesting results. And then we have another application in the pipeline called Figment um, that's not doing training, but it's using all of these algorithms that are already there, like image recognition algorithms or um, algorithms for text classification, for example. And it's just giving you output. So it's a nice visual tool where you can just build with machine learning algorithms and build these things together. This is already um, available right now. There's an, an alpha version that you can download and use on your computer right now if you want to. Uh, and we're still we're still working on this because there's still a lot of, lot of work to do, but that's part of the research that I do. Um, I also have a movie of that. So it's me sitting in the same room <laughs> as always. So here you can see a very simple image classification with just a couple of blocks. And then if I give it an image and then it's looking at images uh, from the internet and it's figuring out a similar image on the other side. So I can give it some objects like a phone, for example, and it's giving me all these images back of a phone. Um, so I have this nice image to image mapping. Um, and there's lots of other examples that I can do. Um, so what about the future of AI? So instead of asking uh, what could a computer never do, I think the question could be like, uh, what can a computer help with? Because I, I think there's still a lot of untapped potential. I've showed you a lot of projects, but there's still so much more that we can do. Um, and I like to think about it as an AI is as an exoskeleton for designers. So the AI is actually helping the designer instead of trying to replace him. It, but it still helps to try to do it yourself and try to figure out what the possibilities are for AI um, in your work. Um, right, that's it. Thanks.